Habari gani karibuni uh, welcome to Kumbukeni again today um, as always thank you for being here with us uh, our brother Milton is having some tech problems so we're hoping he joins us but so far myself and brother Adesoji will be holding the fort uh, we continue to sail um, or I, I need to figure out an African <laughs> way of saying that we continue to do the work uh, despite the fact that our, our brother is having technical issues Adesoji. Yes, uh, as my people, my Yoruba people will say, and uh, I think the word you are looking for, well, in, in Yoruba is Ateswaju, which is will continue on. And um, yes, um, Adesoji, as you know, I'm reaching you from the belly of the beast, the mother of all imperialists. And yes, uh, we are today talking about uh, Brother Thomas Sankara. But before we delve in, uh, sister, you want to continue? Um, you, are you all Nduku? The name is Nduku, uh, again, an African woman who has decided to take action uh, now that I am awakening and decolonizing my mind um, to clear the path for us all to walk towards liberation. And one way we are doing that is by providing the African story uh, from an African perspective, countering the false narrative that the Western media, and you have all seen it, the events of the week, the propaganda that they perpetrate uh, or propagate on all of us, um, telling a story that we all cannot identify with. So that's what we're doing here. Um, Adesoji, I guess you start with a brief history of uh, Baba Sankara. Let's let the people know who he is. Okay, yes. Uh, Thomas Sankara was born into a family of 11, uh, a first son and um, born December 21st, 1949, mm. to an army gendarme who was then based in a place called Yako. Um, Sankara will grow up, well, as any other African kid will grow up on, you know, uh, getting up to all sorts of shenanigans and, you know, but there was one particular event that stood out that will mark him out for, you know, for what we, what we are about to discuss, mm -hmm. which was on the eve of uh, his country's independence from France, upper volta at the time. He, he, you know, he conducted what was known as a mocked, you know, parade. So he unfurled the tricolor pulled it down from a pole and put up his country's flag. Suffice to say, the the French kids who were within the barracks were not too happy with his uh, over exuberance and, you know, and proceeded to fight him. Mm. He, he held his own, but the gendarme, uh, the gendarme commander went to his father, you know, I think you should have a word with his son, you know, that. and the son, you know, listened to his father, but asked his father one question, which is, what have I done wrong? Exactly. And to which the father, well, father said, <laughs> it's not as if you've done anything wrong, but the powers that be consider what you've done exceptional. And so he grows up like I said, um, excelling at his uh, education and, you know, um, nothing unremarkable beyond that event in itself. Okay, Brother Milton is back. Let's hear whether we can hear you, brother. Say something. Uh, greetings, comrades. We can hear you. Look at that. Okay, I can, we can, we can hear you. So Let's stand it up just a little bit. Turn up. Okay, your, so your volume. Volume. I don't know how to do it. This is my neighbor's. Yeah, computer. you are. That's good. This is my neighbor. You're perfect. You're, you're, you're fine. You're fine. You're yeah. audible. You're audible enough. <laughs> you want to introduce yourself and greetings to the people before we continue since you just joined us? Yes, of course. Uh, good people from all over the world. Karibuni, welcome. Uh, Milton Alimadi in New York City, the declining, declining remaining empire. <laughs> While new new empires emerge, the formerly exploited and the formerly colonized parts of the world. You and I might have to start looking for new homes, but let's hope we can continue staying. Go on. 
I just Ooh. was doing the history uh, uh, as you were coming in, brother. Yes, please so, continue, comrade. Okay, so, and yes, he attended uh, Catholic school, you know, and um, he was so good at the school that the the Catholic priest thought he will join the seminary. But um, Sankara had his mind set on other things. And so he put in for the military academy. He got into the military academy. He also excelled as well and was then sent to a place on the eastern part of Africa known as Madagascar. Mm -hmm. That is where he got his political education about what the role of the army should be, which is to help build and help service the population. He went to France, uh, again, like all French military, <laughs> I said French, all former uh, military cadets in French-speaking West Africa. He goes to France. That is where he met Blaise Campare. Him and Blaise Campare would develop a relationship that went beyond the military academy because Blaise Campare's father and mother died when he was young. He was adopted by uh, Thomas Sankara's parents and effectively became his half-brother. So they, again, they part. He went on to become the commandant of the military academy at a place known as uh, Diaso, Dialaso. And there he also made one very remarkable, very remarkable event. There was a series, he went out of the area on a, on a military visit. But he got a phone call, which startled him. And the phone call was like, your soldiers are out on the streets being unruly and what have they. He went, he immediately went back. He brought the soldiers who had the acrimony with the people in the public. And he brought the two parties together and explained, the moment you take off that uniform, no one knows you're a soldier. You're a Bukinabe. So why are you oppressing your fellow Bukinabe at that time, fellow Upper Voltan, wearing your uniform? That uniform is effectively a barrier between you and your people. You're no different from them. And so, in fact, the people were so shocked that, you know, he did that. And then he would also come into favor because he excelled himself in the war in 1974, otherwise called the War of the Poor. Because uh, Bukinabe, uh, Upper Volta, I keep calling it, Upper Volta at the time was fighting Mali over a stretch of land that had no, <laughs> nothing of value, even up to today. There is still no reason as to why they were fighting over that stretch of land. And so Sankara was noted for saying and calling out his commanders for saying, I don't understand why we're fighting this useless war, a waste of resources. In fact, it is two poor countries fighting over an inconsequential piece of land. Hence, the, the, the war getting its name, the war of the poor. He would, since on, he would then move on the rank became part of the government, but he will come into popular consciousness all over the country when he made one statement. There was a government uh, who decided they were going to punish the people because they were out demonstrating about the high uh, cost of living. Sankara being part of the government, came out on the side of the people and said, the, the moment the government forgets that it is there because of the people, it has lost its way. Yeah. He got the, his, uh, the government then, government um, led by Major General Quadrago, got their orders from the French to, how, <laughs> to, put, to put it mildly, to muzzle him. They effectively put him under house arrest. He was taken out of house arrest 
and the coup that subsequently happened will bring him to power on August 4, 1983. Hence, the government is called the August 4 Revolution. So that is a nutshell how Sankara became known as Captain Sankara of Upper Volta, which he would later name Burkina Faso, the land of the upright people. So, yeah. And it's, it's interesting that he names it Burkina Faso because Sankara was big on dignity, on us standing in yeah. dignity and owning our dignity. But also, as you mentioned, the flag, I'm reminded um, of a point he made emphasis on while he was in Harlem, uh, when he went to his black house, which uh, he went to um, after rejecting to go to the White House under the conditions that they, they put forward. So he was coming to the United States to speak at the UN, but he made several tours while here, and he was invited to the White House uh, but they made a requirement that he show his speech to them before he goes to the White House. Right. His speech that he was supposed to do at the UN. That was a condition for him to be invited to the White House. See, this is this is what these oppressors think, that going to sit with them is so valuable that we're going to give up whatever it is that we want to do by ourselves and, and in order to go be with them because it's such a special occasion. Anyway, he says no. But, but, but you can't blame them because <laughs> before that, it had always worked. Right. But he said, let me let you know I am the, the black man who has black consciousness and mm -hmm. uh, that means nothing to me. No, that house means nothing to me. My house is in Harlem. Let me go see my people. And he goes there. But while he was there, the point I was making before we get into that, because I'm sure we'll talk about that visit, um, <clears throat> was the flag of Burkina Faso that they, they choose once they get their independence, which is uh, green, red, and they have a yellow star. But he says, <clears throat> first of all, it's important that everyone in, who is listening to him there and to the masses that he would finally be talking to, if, that it's important that they understand that they selected that flag based on the liberation flag, the Marcus Garvey flag, the red, black, and a green flag. He said it was essential that everyone understand that that's why they chose that flag. And they didn't put black because he said they were in Africa. The people in Africa already represented the blackness of it. Absolutely. And to see the video uh, in Alimadi, we, we should actually share it. I don't know if I shared it. I'm going to go back and get it. And the, the reception from the audience when he says that, just seeing that unity and that knowing of the continental Africans and the diaspora Africans knowing that this is the thing that we have, that unites us, our blackness, was amazing. But yes. But we also should point out the <clears> fact <throat> that how many African leaders would have said something like that in terms of identifying with the black liberation flag? Mm -hmm. No. They don't totally, even admit it. Totally zero. How many of them even know about the black liberation <laughs> flag? You see? So yeah, I, I'm glad you picked that point out because I also had noted that point and that was quite remarkable. I would also, I would also highlight the fact that not only did he speak at in Harlem, but the venue, the Harriet Tubman School. Right. So effectively tying everything together, the flag, him being there, and someone minded with the liberation of black people. Right. And to add on to that, we have to give our recognition and kudos and honors to the late Ilombe Brath. Ilombe Brath was a remarkable Pan-African who organized all those types of events. Mm. Um, he had uh, weekly Pan-African meetings at that school on a regular mm. basis. So it was good that he invited him to that humble school and the people who used to come there on a weekly basis nice. were able to see uh, our brother, Thomas Sankara. And Sankara asked the question there, yeah, one of the questions, I mean, he asked, he posed a lot of positions and um, I would just like to explore a couple of them, maybe two or three of them. The first is, he said, uh, revolution has been explained. And so he doesn't need to explain what revolution is. So the question would be, what is revolution to you, my comrades? Well, revolution comes in many aspects, but I think to me, the most critical one should be economic self-determination, without which independence has proven to me completely meaningless <laughs> in Africa. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's what he was trying to implement. Mm. Um, and of course, you can't implement the economic liberation without first self-consciousness. Mm. 
Mm. So he was going very methodically about it by changing the name first as the sister uh, uh, proposed was very critical. You get the mindset prepared for work. And then by starting to shed all the aspects and elements of economic dependency, that to me was revolution, to make sure that people could feed themselves food self-sufficient within three years, as you said, as you recall mm. from the Upright Man documentary. said, if you want any evidence of imperialism, look at your plate. If your food <laughs> is imported, that is evidence of imperialism. But even in the production of housing, production of health care, uh, production of knowledge and education, building all those schools around the country, building all those dispensaries for healthcare, and then denouncing foreign aid mm. that perpetuates and maintains dependency. Mm. He said, no, I don't want foreign aid. I don't want you to send us any food. If you really are serious about helping us, send us tractors and agricultural equipment so we can produce our own food. That to me are the essence of revolution for any African country. Mm, mm. So you, even in that moment, he also includes the dancers, the singers, right? He says that they showed revolution. So for me, and I agree with with everything Brother Alimadi said, that is revolution. Um, revolution for us Africans, what that means for people who have been subjugated, mm -hmm. uh, demonized, and detached from their culture for so many years means breaking the chains of that system that does yeah. that to us, no matter what the cost will be, and coming through, standing in our full black consciousness, owning our culture, going back to our culture, standing in it in pride, uh, the way we dress, the way we eat, the way we sing, the way we move, the way we love, the way we do everything, Right. being African. And he makes that point in that speech saying you should not be embarrassed to be African. You should show yes. everywhere you go in the office and on the streets your Africanness, right? Yes. He said which wear is, it. Right? Wear it everywhere. Wear, wear it everywhere. everywhere. Mm -hmm. So which is why people like me are constantly dressing African when we can. And we're going to be supporting anyone who's putting out African. And I'm going to say, because Brother Almadi mentioned all the other points, but on this point, for those of us who are taking on revolution to bring back African culture in, in, in fashion, right? In the way we dress, in the outward appearance. We should not also exploit Africans as we do that because I'm seeing a lot of African outwear being sold for ridiculous amounts. I would like to see most of us and a lot of us, and I'm going to participate in making sure that we provide clothing items that are supporting African economy and African culture that is affordable to all Africans. Um, so that because that then brings us into the whole thing of capitalism, right, where some Africans and a lot of whites, um, I, I, I will digress, I'm thinking of something, but I'll digress if I speak on it, I might speak on it later, are taking advantage of this moment where there's black consciousness, right? And the way they're taking advantage of it is getting these items that we are looking for to go back to our black consciousness and putting a high price tag on them. And we should say no to that for those of us who are doing this work, because that's part of the revolution. Don't just go back to your culture through style, but if the style presents itself in a way that is exploitative, say no to it and find one that isn't. And by the way, it's not only uh, Europeans that are doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, China is also that a, too. Big, a, a big okay. culprit in that. Mm -hmm. so I agree with you because um, not only are we denied technology to be able to manufacture, but even the artisanal production <laughs> of our people is now being usurped. Mm -hmm. So if it's being manufactured, whether it's manufactured in Europe or manufactured in China, then sent back to us, then where is the market for those that are producing still on a small scale level exactly. in African countries? And on that note, when you talk about the issue of culture, of course, it resonates and echoes what was very big with Amilcar Cabral. So on that, they were on the same, same page, wavelength, yes, 100% uh, yes, yes. same level, the importance of culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, Cabral wrote a whole phenomenal essay about culture and revolution. Uh, so I really, really encourage people to read that as well. And you're right. Not only did he announce that he would send 
a, the National Dance Indeed. Troupe right. to visit and perform in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And then he said, make sure they also go and perform in other places. Don't keep them to yourselves, right? <laughs> yeah. But he also invited them. He said, next <clears throat> year, there's going yeah. to a major cultural festival in Burkina Faso. Mm -hmm. And Harlem should be represented, even if you send only one mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. So um, then, but he also mentioned one key thing as a revolutionary. He said, uh, it is important to remember one thing. While we're here discussing and talking to each other as Africans, mm -hmm. there are spies in the room in order to make a report tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You are supposed to move quietly and talk amongst yourselves. I thought he said, I thought he said, no matter what, whether they're there or not, he's going to speak the same way he speaks. And even if the TVs come, he's going to still speak the same way he speaks. Truth to power. Truth yes. to power. Yeah. But we Truth need, he, said, he said we need to always organize, of course, because exactly. on that same part of the conversation, it was talking about the reason why we lost Maurice Bishop. Thank mm -hmm. you. Very Which is why was you take it there, take it away. Where you yeah, he said he had <laughs> met Maurice Bishop the previous year. There you go. <laughs> At that time, that was actually before the coup that brought him into power. At that mm -hmm. time, he was still prime minister, I believe, yep, in, yep, in yep, the government. Yep. Yep. So he went uh, to the uh, non-aligned summit in uh, New Delhi, in India. New Delhi, mm -hmm. yep. And that's where he met Fidel Castro. He met uh, Maurice Bishop, Maurice and Bishop met yep. many other revolutionary leaders. When he got back, he was arrested by imperialism because obviously the French intelligence uh, had been monitoring in his own I, country. Let's not forget, but go on, brother. He was, a, yeah, then monitoring while he was at the conference, and they saw the enthusiastic encounters <laughs> <laughs> he had with Castro and with Maurice Bishop, and they sent the message that when this guy lands back, your prime minister should be arrested. <laughs> So he was arrested, but he said thank you to the uh, passion and revolutionary organization of the population. Mm -hmm. They came and they sprang him loose. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the rest was history. Ultimately, uh, the coup that uh, uh, launched him to the leadership of the revolution occurred that same year in 1983. And uh, speaking to the power of the people, he said um, in that speech at in Harlem that uh, South Africa's apartheid, mm. we have to remember when people stand up, imperialism trembles. And I mentioned that in light of what has transpired over the week, wherein if you look across Western media, um, suffice to say there's been a loud silence. You're talking about the uh, Israel's, for, yeah. Israel's retaliation against uh, yes against the attack by Hamas, mm -hmm. which is uh, I, well, I see now even um, some of the uh, corporate media are beginning to realize that that one-sidedness cannot be mm. sustained. It is unsustainable, and they're beginning finally to acknowledge that the uh, Israel's retaliation has been completely disproportional by ordering the entire population, essentially, to of move. Gaza to vacate, while at the same time, the borders are shut, uh, access to water, access to food, access to medicine is denied, which, of course, is an international war crime. Yeah. On land by, that was theirs originally, that did not belong by, to the Israel Israelis. By any measure. So I think, uh, as Sankara said, in another context, he said, woe to the leaders that gag their people. Mm. Woe to the leaders that gag their people. And he said that when he had resigned initially from the government. As, prime, as a cultural minister. Because of the propaganda yeah. and the stifling of open and... Uh, you know, this country prides itself, the United States, mm. on so-called free speech. But of course, uh, many of you that uh, you know read my book, Manufacturing Hate, you saw <laughs> what consequence we suffered when we were the only ones writing the contrarian editorial on the NATO war on uh, on Libya, mm -hmm. when they were all on the same page, mm. completely one-sided 
totally ignoring the other narrative, even ignoring when the so-called freedom fighters started killing Libyans and beheading them, ones that looked like you and I, and posting them on Facebook, on YouTube, not covered, ignored totally by the New York Times. Thankfully, the Wall Street Journal broke the silence. Then eventually, about a month later, in fact, <laughs> they waited after Gaddafi had been deposed. <laughs> then outlets like the New York Times started writing about it. So let me just finish this part very quickly. We wrote many editorials denouncing the war, calling for an end of the war, demanding that the White House say something about this, demanding that the New York Times cover the uh, massacres, ethnic cleansing of Libyans that look like us, the National Urban League, Mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, NAACP, that they all issue statements. Mm. After we, and we put the phone numbers urging people to call all of these organizations. Our website, and many of you know the story by now, but I'm just repeating it for people that are not familiar with it. Our website was hijacked for three days. We could not access our website. And whenever we called uh, Network Solutions, they would say, oh, it's a technical glitch, technical glitch for three mm. days. On the third day, I called at 4 a.m. <laughs> and I said, you know, sometimes I, I woke up, something told me, no, something is wrong. I called, I said, I don't believe you guys. Give me your names. I don't believe of the thousands and thousands of websites that you host, nobody can access their website as well for three days. Mm -hmm. Give me your name. I got three names. Went back to bed by eight or nine when I came up, when I woke, the website was back on. So I said, wait a minute, something very funny is going on. <laughs> That editorial that I just discussed right now mm -hmm. was deleted. Mm. Imagine a private company, our host, Network Solutions, allowing, obviously it must have been government, the US mm -hmm. government, who else would be mm -hmm. interested in deleting that uh, article, editorial, allowing them to intervene in a private operation, supposedly freedom. in the interest of freedom of speech. So freedom of speech does not exist. I'm not surprised by what we're saying right now. And sister and brothers, let me just add one more point. It's not surprising that I'm having problems with my book now. As many of you know, I announced this a few weeks ago. True, true, true. My own publisher is no longer promoting my book and not even printing the, mm. <laughs> the physical uh, copy. And how did I find out? One of my John Jay students told me about this. So. Uh, I have demanded to get my copyright back, as I mentioned a few episodes ago. And I thank everybody that supported my GoFundMe so far. We've, country, uh, we've raised 750. The publisher wants $3,000 to give me the copyright to my own book back. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody who is interested in supporting this GoFundMe, uh, please feel free to contact me and I will send you the link. My email is malimadi at gmail.com. And let me add just one final point. Last week in class, my John Jay class, I said, students, that class is in, it's called Religion, Terrorism, and Violence in the Africana World. So we examine the definitions of terrorism and through the many lectures, the readings, and the videos, the, sh the, the students have a broader view now. Mm -hmm. They also saw uh, the Battle of Algiers, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So I knew they wanted to talk about what's going on right now yep. between Israel and Palestine. So I said, since this is the topic really we've been discussing, I'm going to devote 15 minutes to any of you to say whatever you want on this topic. The class, I have about 25 students. Five students spoke. And then I could tell just by looking at the students and more of them wanted to speak on this issue. So I finally asked, I said, how many of you would actually like to speak, but you're afraid that whatever you might say could be taken out of context and taken out of this classroom by somebody? Mm -hmm. About 15 mm -hmm. raised their hands. 15 students in a college admitting that they're afraid to speak freely. Imagine if you can't speak freely in school, in a classroom. Right, let me stop at that point. So uh, let me stop at that point. 
I'm, I'm actually it's going connected, but I don't want us to get. I, I'm actually going <laughs> to take. Away. I'm actually going to take your point and continue because this is the threat that we face, and we are talking about Baba Sankara and him speaking truth to power. So it's very much in line with what he would want to be said. Uh, be, be, that fear is the result. One right, one incident that causes that fear, not the only one. In the same week, a student from NYU, a law school student from NYU, who uh, leads a group, uh, I forget what the group is, <clears throat> put out an, a, a message because there was unrest amongst the students <clears throat> saying that it was not right what Israel was doing. I'm paraphrasing. Those were not her exact words. She had her job offer, job offer that was already given to her, rescinded by the company, the, the law firm that had offered it because she voiced, publicly voiced her opinion about what's happening to the Palestinians. What right. that does is for all law students, for anyone who's looking for a job, who wants to say something to support human beings who are being attacked, who are subjugated, who are colonized, fear, right? Of course. And Be quiet. And Don't the offer them of, support. Of, of that, setting that example. Actually. That is You're their right. goal, right? It's but not then again, just to punish that one person, but it's to send the clear message to everybody else. And this this law firm went ahead to say, and we want to know all the students in that organization who supported what she said, because we want to make sure we don't hire them by mistake. Right. And we, right. as Africans, this is what revolution is, should say that's not acceptable. We should right. make sure that law firm goes out of business. That's me saying that. From now on, unless you hire these students, you're out of business. We should not allow anyone who does that to be in business, to be able to do that, to create that fear that stops us from speaking up against marginalization and the system's criminal ways. So I'm, I'm going to quickly read what Sankara said. And um, sister, before you read that, let me <clears throat> add to that, because this at the same time also, we cannot excuse our misrulers in African countries. Mm -hmm. They have exposed us and made us so vulnerable because of their mismanagement mm -hmm. of affairs on the African continent. How is that that 60 years after Uhuru, 63. after independence, 63 in most cases, most countries, they have not been able to coalesce into stronger units, even if the entire continent was not yet united, mm -hmm. at least five regional blocks that are federated and integrated, meaning we are using our resources to build up our economies, mm -hmm. because then we would not be such, you know, such a vulnerable position to blackmail, because that is what it is. You're blackmailed by the World Bank, you're blackmailed by the IMF, you're blackmailed by the White House, you're blackmailed by 10 Downing Street, mm -hmm. In uh, <laughs> Paris, I don't know where, you know, the LC the Palace blocks, is, uh, the LSA, is called right? LC Palace, yeah. Exactly. So we cannot absorb them. <laughs> Ultimately, the responsibility and the biggest crime is the failure of our leaders to do the right thing by our people and leave us exposed to this kind of retaliation everywhere mm -hmm. where Africans live. Yeah. And, and as I read this, I'm reminded of Matt, I forget his last name, Lord have mercy. He, he went to the UN a few years ago and spoke up about Palestine and lost his job. That's another situation where freedom of speech was, uh, was, was denied. So Baba Sankara says, I, I, speak, I speak out in, this was at the UN, in front of everyone at the UN. I speak out in indignation as I think of the Palestinians whom this most inhuman humanity has replaced with another people, a people who only yesterday were themselves being martyred at leisure. I think of the valiant Palestinian people, the families which have been splintered and split up and are wandering throughout the world seeking asylum. Courageous, determined, stoic, tireless, the Palestinians remind us all of the need and moral obligation to respect the rights of our people. When we speak about, at least for myself, I speak for myself, Mark Lamont, yes, thank you, June Liggins. Mark Lamont spoke up at the UN and he lost his job for doing so. Correct. And all we are trying, we, we are saying, not trying to, because we are saying it, is what Israel has done for years to the Palestinians is wrong. That is not your land, it is borrowed land. You literally, the, the Brits, and the U.S. 
were looking for a place for you to settle because you had your people's Jewish people had been attacked by the Germans after World War II. They looked in Kenya, they looked in Uganda, they looked in, in Algeria, several places. And they decided because they claimed to be a self-assigned position of deciding for other peoples, right? Because apparently we did not have a right to our own lands. They decided that Palestine was the place to place you. And you were supposed to stay within certain borders and you've crossed those borders and infringed on other people's uh, freedoms. And so those people now are saying to you, you need to move out and let us let us live freely and in peace. And we're going to act all of us like we cannot speak about this. And Thomas Sankara is saying no. He's going to, to the UN and talking about it and saying it's wrong. And I'm saying no. And I'm coming in front of you all on Kumkening. It's saying we have to speak on both sides. It is not right that Jewish children and, and women and men, let's not forget the men. They always say women and, and children as if the men don't matter. The men too. Are being killed but it's also not right that israel is constantly killing palestinians and denying them their rights they are literally asking israel we we like to say this like this is popular right take your knees off our necks we need to breathe is essentially at, what at, palestine at the, is saying at the same time we need to come back to the ultimate uh, criminal in all of this which is of course the united, united states, united states. states uh, exactly united states uh, imperialism all of this could not be done Without, without the yeah. financial and Mark. military support of uh, billions of dollars every year by the United States. The United States essentially has financed the abandonment of mm. the Palestinian people and has abandoned the whole concept of the Palestinians having their own state. And I think the rest of the world should make it clear to the United States that this is completely unacceptable and unsustainable. And that we can't just sit there and watch and pretend that we are not watching the catastrophe that is going on right now in Gaza. And also, um, just to add to that as well, um, the historical context is not is not going to miss. Um, in terms of uh, what's it called? In terms of resources, in order to understand what has transpired, there is a brilliant book out. Um, it came out a couple of years ago. Uh, it's titled um, "Against Our Better Judgment." Against Our Better Judgment by Alison Ware. It's uh, it's a beaten up copy. My copies are always beaten up. And um, in fact, there is even a website: uh, www.ifamericansnew.org. www.ifamericansnew.com. You go on there. You find all the resources with regards to Palestine and what has transpired. I just heard you was that dot org or com. You said dot to... org dot okay. org dot org org w dot uh, if americans knew dot org, which actually was the basis of this book. This book here. So there is um, there is tons of resources out there. I mean, uh, there's another one. Um, <laughs> What's it called? Uh, the Great War of Civilization. This was written by uh, late Robert Fisk, one of, in fact, one of my best journalists in the UK, um, lived in Beirut for 35 years. And so he wrote, you can see the size of the book. <laughs> so, and th this gives you, uh, the, war, or the war, on, uh, war of Civilization gives you a broad picture of everything that has happened in the middle east right from you know the 1800s mm -hmm. and up to date so there is no conjecture nothing all the history is there right and comrade may i add one other point before yes, you move go on. on with uh, another aspect of sankara and all this comes back to the corruption of the capitalist electoral system mm -hmm. right because all of these politicians mm. some of them may actually be decent human beings right <laughs> yep but right. they are so beholden to campaign contributions, contributions yeah donations from wealthy private donors that they realize this could be suicidal for me to take the right position mm. to say yes let me condemn what hamas did but let me condemn what israel is doing disproportionate locking up an entire country in a genocidal package 
how can you survive without food, without water, without electricity? But they won't say that, and they won't even acknowledge what is going on because they know that somebody else running for that same office will use it against them and get that <laughs> donation <laughs> and probably win that election. For and that, to me, is the saddest part of I this. I time. also I also wanted to add a decision before we continue with Baba Sankara, right? And and he says uh, throughout this speech in the UN, he talks about when he gives his speech, it's not just for the people of Burkina Faso, and he names a long list of who else. So Baba Sankara standing in his Pan Africanism, in his humanity, right? Uh, uh, wanting good for all human beings. Yes. But I, I'd like to remind our audience that at one point, once upon a time, the Kenya Land Freedom Army was designated as terrorists and to this day kenya nelson has not mandela nelson mandela was a, a terrorist, terrorist <laughs> right and you all know the list of the black uh, uh diaspora africans who were labeled terrorists we go with dr king malcolm all those people so and to this day kenya has not honored those people so we as africans have to sit back and look at situations and ask ourselves what is actually going on instead of going along with what is being said by the media right. Right. because what the and west that, and, that, and that is important of history and that's why it's good that uh, this what you presented that aspect as well yes you cannot start history at the most convenient point for your own narrative, uh, narrative. Mm -hmm. or your argument mm -hmm. we have to go back as far as you can, as far as, of, as see is available. when that clash initially germinated mm -hmm. and take it from there. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's it's clear. It's the early, it's the late 1800s when the Zionist movement was formed. It was formed in Europe. Uh, the initial point was looking for a homeland, but you know the the what happened in 1930 then accelerated that need initially the cause was to look for somewhere in europe but they balked at that idea the proposal was initially uganda first and then it was kenya second and they said well, no. they were adjoining colonies so be, uh, yeah yeah so the same exactly thing. so it was a question right. of take take or right. peak Right, but the most important point is the history. It would be like studying Africa's contemporary condition oh without God. going to the Berlin Conference, That's without it. going to the scramble That's of Africa. That is it. That is but, it. Then but how also, could we be able to analyze? But That's also the interconnected condition. interconnectedness of us all, right? When a Kenyan or a Ugandan says this business in Palestine has nothing to do with me, I will remind you that you could have been in Palestine's shoes if they chose Uganda or Kenya. And this not, would not be only an that, issue for because you. Because then this is what I would say to them. Because back in the day, when we were fighting the apartheid white racist regime mm -hmm. in South Africa, had it not been for global solidarity, mm -hmm. that process would have taken much, much longer. And who knows how long? You can't say because we don't have the same uh, complexion. Yeah. That is or not the same our, our, our <laughs> problem. You know, that is not an intelligent position to take. Mm -hmm. It took Cubans. Some look like you and I, some were European Cubans who came and sacrificed themselves in Angola. Number one, to assure Angola's independence and then to liberate Namibia, Namibia. and then to get Nelson Mandela uh, freed mm -hmm. at the Battle of Quito Panaval. They didn't say, oh, this is something in Africa. This is not up to us. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, not a very intelligent position to take. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make sense. Yes. Um, so that said, actually, I was going to go into the UN, which is where he says, I, I bring you fraternal greetings from, 200, uh, from 7 million <coughs> women and children who have refused to die of ignorance, hunger and thirst. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've spoken about it again, you know, once you deny someone comfort, safety sustenance what are you effectively saying you want them to disappear but uh africa is replete with history of people not disappearing actually fighting back you know 
but we have to constantly drum the beat and he drummed the beats for western sahara which is yes. still occupied as of today right. by morocco again by france and the united states and the united states <laughs> there you go <laughs> oh, <laughs> Yeah, because of course imperialism pays. There's a common theme. Imperialism pays. It's not done for free. Mm -hmm. So when uh, a neo-colonial leader is uh, is maintained in Africa, mm. it means imperialism is benefiting. Mm -hmm. You know, benefiting from having a stooge who can perform and undermine mm. uh, pan other Pan-African leaders. It means it's a stooge who is providing the resources uh at that uh, cheap price mm. it means a stood that is guaranteeing a market for manufactured product mm. so it's not surprising that it's not a coincidence that a patrice lumumba is brutally murdered a uh, kwame kuma is deposed at the same time a mobutu maintained <laughs> in power for 37 years every mm -hmm. time there's an internal intervention uprising to try to remove him. The United States, together with rescue. Morocco, would intervene. It's not a surprise that General Museveni is maintaining Uganda for 37 years, going on 38 years now. Mm -hmm. Let's think mm -hmm. about it. So imperialism has exacted a tremendous price against the people of Africa. And of course, the reason we are discussing Sankara today is because he paid the ultimate price for standing up against imperialism. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, that will have been 36 years today, <coughs> October, October 15, 1987. Mm -hmm. and, and the reactionary who killed him, <laughs> not accidental that he was sustained in power for 27, 27 years. years. Look at that. <laughs> Yeah. And what's even more egregious about it was the fact that one of the speeches he gave a couple of months before spoke to mm -hmm. the issue of debt mm -hmm. in the African continent. And so question is, I mean, my question to you, comrades, is mm -hmm. when you look around the African continent now, would you say <laughs> the debt is hindrance or as aided progress i think it's time to just end the show and walk away because there's no use for us to talk anymore no but he he actually points out right <clears throat> before i talk about what's happening today he points out before he decides to kick the imf out of his country but during the a un speech he points out that it is funny this word aid when you look at Burkina Faso, then it was uh, upper vault. When you look at it and you see no progress, you see no development. So what has this aid been doing that claims to be developing, right? It is given in the name of development, but when you look, there's no development. Mm. He decides to take out aid. Baba Sankara decides to take out aid, right? The IMF is kicked out of Burkina Faso when they get their independence. And in four years, four years, there is development evident for everyone to see because he organized his people he educated he, his people he equipped them and he empowered them to stand in their blackness and realize that they were capable to build their own community and not rely be dependent on the western in fact he discouraged them from being dependent on western powers so to answer your question directly <clears throat> it appears that there's progress but given the years of aid we should be looking amazing. We should be a world power in Africa. We, you, should, you should have no need for anything in Africa. Given the years of aid, given the resources coming out of Africa, and given the intelligence of the people in Africa, Africa should be a place that you... It should not be a third world country. Or whatever else that some ignorant so-called leaders call it when they get on mics. Right. So... I think uh, sometimes, you know, African people, because they're under so much duress, they don't have time to think logically. Mm. How did England become England? By committing extermination all over the world, you know, multiple genocides. They did what? You know, <laughs> yep, that's a great book. 
uh, we should post it, how Europe underdeveloped Africa, by plundering resources, by wiping out indigenous populations. And that was the whole process of capital accumulation, right? And that's how England was able to industrialize. How did the United States become the United States? By the genocide, by the exploitation of the labor of enslaved Africans who endured much cruelty to produce the wealth, King Cotton to make the United States what the United States became. So does anybody in his or her right mind believe that the United States, which is a capitalist country, which is managed by corporations, mm. either CEOs who become the executive or the legislators in this country, mm. or CEOs who contribute to people who become the executives or legislators in this country. Do people really believe that these same people are going to take a portion of their wealth in the form of so-called foreign aid and develop an African country, African country to be able to grow and to compete with them? Does that make sense to anybody? <laughs> do companies, <laughs> do corporations in this country aid other corporations so that they could compete with them? If they won't do it here in the United States, why would they go to empower any African country? So obviously, the purpose of aid is to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. It is to maintain the dependency relationship mm -hmm. with the countries that are already industrialized, that are already wealthy. And that is why when they give you the money, they come with conditions so-called structural adjustment. Mm -hmm. They tell you what you can do and what you cannot do mm. with the money. How is that aid? Or even if it's a loan, <laughs> when you get loan from the World Bank, <laughs> a loan, not even aid. If you get a loan, they also tell you what you cannot do. <laughs> Kenya is going under the same process yeah. right now. The IMF is reviewing Kenya to see whether they are deserving. You know, it's a problem. And they've tied their system into the global system in such a way that they can't function without this money now. Mm -hmm. They can only function by actually taking a revolutionary position, exactly. which is what Sankara was doing in Burkina Faso. And that is what they feared would spread. Mm -hmm. And that is why imperialism decided that before this example spreads, <laughs> we need yeah. to eliminate this one particular African leader. And at, at this one, he spoke about it. He was killed three months after he denounced the, the yeah. burden, the dead oh, burden. Dead burden. And he said it, he predicted it. He said, if I do it individually, I will be, not be alive to attend next the year's next summit. Mm -hmm. He was not alive three months, months later. later. Hmm. But this is where also his blood is on, on the hands of many of those African leaders. Because mm -hmm. he told them, he said, they cannot assassinate 54 of us. They can't, but they can kill uh, one, person. One, one person. So let's stand together and make a joint statement, issue a communique at the end of this conference. And Peter, they made sure he would not attend <laughs> another conference as he predicted. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, he knew that was the third rail of imperialism. And, and, and just that, he had touched it. Yeah, and just to speak on him empowering his people also to to not be dependent. We when we talk about we we want to we we think we suggest we ob our observation we analyze that the IMF and the World Bank should be kicked out, right? That the imperialists should be kicked out of Africa. A lot of question responses you get is so. What are you going to do? What do we do in place, right? What Sankara did. And one of the things that he did, he said, was they had the economic ambi ambition to work to ensure the use of the mind and strength of each inhabitant of Burkina Faso. So basically, we as a people are equipped just in our mind and our bodies, our capability to produce what is necessary to provide two meals a day and drinking water. The problem is we have had our standards uh, uh, 
put here with Western way of living, right? And right. none of us want to walk away from that. None of us want to walk away from an expensive dinner at the Hilton. None of us wants to walk away from a gown that costs $10,000 so that I can show how much I spend for my wedding or whatever other occasion, right? None of, one of us want to walk away from the Pajeros we're driving in Kenya and around Africa, the whatever other car you're... He's saying, as long as you have your basics, Let's get rid of these people that are marginalizing us. Let's focus on the basics. Let's we ourselves build to make sure that those basics are met. And we All can right, progress so, from so, there. So, sister, you actually hit on uh, a very good uh, a very good spot because that is something that uh, Nyerere, and I'm trying to uh, look exactly. up the name of the journalist. I can't find it right now, but I may find it before the show is over. Said in an interview with an Indian journalist, Mm -hmm. I think it was in 1985. I think he had already stepped down as president shortly mm -hmm. after he had stepped down. He was still chairman of the ruling party in Tanzania. And he said, part of the problem is that we don't know or appreciate the things we already have. Mm -hmm. We think the grass is always greener, greener on the, on the other side. side. Yep. So then I know that even in Tanzania, there are things that we have or could produce locally. Mm -hmm. But the mind says no, unless it's imported, it's no good. He said, because we're always measuring our standards by the standards of the West. Mm -hmm. He said, for example, India. India has advanced nuclear technology, other forms of energy sources, technology. He says, if India is seen as attainable, and we focus on dealing with India, we would get it at a much better cost. Mm. The technology would be much more appropriate for our conditions. And India would then benefit from our resources at a more equitable rate as well. Mm -hmm. sure, sure. But all of us are saying, oh no, it has to be from the West. It has to be from the West. So interview, if I get the name of that journalist, I will, uh, I will let, let tell you so you can post it. It's a short interview, only about 25 minutes, but he spoke exactly about what you just said. We don't value the things we have because we are always looking at the West. Everything has to be by the standards of the West, number one. Number two, to add to what you said, mm -hmm. we could also accomplish a lot by recalibrating, as you said, our consumption behavior hmm. and spending, spending patterns. He said no minister is allowed to fly exactly. in the first class in Burkina Faso. <laughs> you have to travel economy. None of them are allowed to go around in luxurious vehicles. All of them need to travel in small economical vehicles so that mm -hmm. the savings can be used to build dispensaries throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And there's something else I want to read actually verbatim that he said in another interview. We are ashamed when we hear of African leaders who build palaces in Europe or deposit large amounts of money in Swiss banks or elsewhere, considering all the poverty of many Africans. Mm. This is shameful and we cannot allow it. This is why we fight against corruption. And in our fight against corruption, we are merciless. Mm. How many African presidents say and practice something like this? Mm. That is the problem. What he said. I was going to say thank you for mentioning Baba Nyerere because yesterday was uh, Siku Ya Nyerere, Nyerere Day in Tanzania, where they celebrate him. He passed away. He transitioned on October 14th in 1999. So every year on that day, they remember him. Uh, and we rest. will have a show on him with the ancestors. Yes, yes. I, was, I think his birthday is sometime in December. So we. I was also going to. I was also going to add to the. Oh, another book dropped. I was going to add to the issue of probity with regards to what um, Sankara spoke about. Mm. When they came to the United States, do you know that it was four of them to a room? There were twenty-seven. <laughs> There were there were twenty eight, but he was four of them to including him, right? He didn't get special him. treatment. You see, yeah. That's my kind of and, leader. And guess what he did? You know? He he said we would ask for they asked for beds, you know, beds two beds in a room. 
two beds and then you could throw a mattress on the floor. <laughs> and he says, you know, and I quote, you will look back on days like this and remember what it used to be like when you were students. Right. The money mm. we save on the hotel bills will mm. go towards digging a well. In the last it's crazy. Uh, general session of the United Nations, dictator Museveni <laughs> sent 72 members of the delegation. And I guarantee you, they do not share each of them had a room and a driver rooms, and a maid okay. and, a, and a shopping assistant. You know, they bring their wives who go shopping and they have a driver and an assistant to take them yeah. shopping. Yeah, let me read one other thing. And this shows you <clears throat> where this uh, man's heart was, where this comrade's heart was. <clears throat> Excuse me. I became a civil servant. I was one of the lucky 0.035% of people in my country who are civil servants and receive a regular salary. Mm. Do you think it is normal for me to get a regular salary while the rest of the population, millions and millions of people are continually suffering? No, Question. that is not normal. And we fight it beginning with our leaders, the president, the ministers, and all in authority. And yeah. that is when he cut his pay and the pay of the all senior, other officials. Yes, he must. And that's why we keep saying we must keep demanding that in every African country we have rulers that emulate and practice what Sankara was carrying out in Burkina Faso. Okay. Um, in 2014, Vadana Shiva, most guys. Uh, Comrades would know her, you know, the lady, the Indian lady with the dot on her head. Yes. She said, the white man's burden is becoming increasingly heavy for the earth and especially for the South. And that's in 2014. Mm. But in 1983, Sankara's position was, we need to protect and live in harmony with the natural environment because if we don't, we might not be here to be part of it any longer. Unbelievable. Af African societies are living through an abrupt rupture with their own culture. We've adapted badly to our situation. Our population are growing as more as well as our needs. But unfortunately, the nature does not expand in light with what those needs are. We have become great predators mm. of the earth indeed and so with that he started you know the the green um reforestation of burkina faso deciding you know what and this was in the 80s yeah he, the seen, green revolution you could say seen exactly seen way before all of this oh uh, carbon trading, carbon this, carbon that. Oh, right. the, this was in the eighties. Be before celebrities made it. Before uh, exactly popular yeah. and famous. You know, <laughs> in yeah. the eighties, you know, made sure you know. One of the things he did was okay. He he, you know, he banned uh, the cutting of trees. Mm. He banned uh, the wandering of livestock, which would you know, as he says it, livestock that would just go and start ripping up green vegetation, they need to be corralled. And, and that's a major problem in uh, in Nigeria now. Exactly. You know? And in exactly. Uganda as well, actually. Exactly. So a program <clears throat> of reforestation was started. In fact, he came up with a very innovative way, which is, listen, if you want to profess love to whoever, go and profess love with saplings, take trees, you want to go and ask for a hand in marriage? Take ten trees. That's going. That's going to be in, my requirement of, moving forward. Flowers. If, if you <laughs> want to, a... if you want to court Nduko, bring trees. Not flowers. <laughs> Not flowers. Don't send me flowers. Send me a you tree know. that we can plant. Actually, what about, plant what, it. What about chocolate? <laughs> that, that will be our date. Let's go plant a tree. Go on. You know. So, so he said. You know, bring trees, and before you know it, it caught on. People mm -hmm. were actually, you know. Exchanging trees, planting trees, you know, they had tree planting exercise. In fact, 
which is now funny. There was a, um, a sister, um, Professor Wagari Mafai, mm-hmm. in Kenya, who was doing something similar at the same time. Yes. So you will find that there is, if you go on the United Nations uh, website, you will see something called the Green Belt Initiative. Guess where that idea come from? And there is no mention. Which is not a white man's... In, in, it there was... is no mention anywhere of Sankara. Right. Well, let them know today. Let it be known today, uh, Adesoji, where that came from and who is to be created. And what was the idea about? It was <clears throat> to create a wall from West Africa to East Africa. That wall has now joined, but whoever came up with that idea, his name is nowhere in the annals of history. Right. And by the way, we also have to uh, pay homage to the price that uh, Matai paid in Gary Kenya. Matai. Mm. Awful, 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 awful treatment she got. Beated many times, arrested. They pulled her times. hair from her scalp, like would pull her braids from her scalp to torture her. And she went back to do the same thing again mm-hmm. and again. Mm-hmm. And she, of course, deserves a uh, future show. On Fellow her. Africans did that to her, by oh. the way. Fellow That's Africans. Of course. That's mm-hmm. of course. Now, but not all Africans are Africans, you see. Mm-hmm. I but found you know, the name of the journalist, by the way. So just quickly okay. mentioned, Saeed Nakvi. He's an Indian journalist, uh, S-A-E-E-D. The interview the with name, Nyerere? With Nyerere. And the last name is N-A-Q-V-I, Saeed Nakvi. Nakvi. Okay. Yes, it's a brilliant interview. I strongly recommend people see it on YouTube. And you know what's funny with the um, Professor Wagari Matai's treatment? The irony of it all. Who hosted an environmental summit recently? <laughs> I'm glad you're calling them out. Yep. Apparently, Kenya is. Your friends in Kenya. After yep. they pulled hair out of her. Can you imagine? Outlet, now they're leading. Right. In fact, the conference should have been named after her. Thank you. you know? And this is where, you know, we also blame our comrades. In the Maasai Climate and, Conference. And there. They should have made it. You know, just uh, tribute to her. Mm, mm, mm. So advocating this when everybody else was demonizing and criminalizing her, calling her a prostitute, women aren't supposed to be behaving like this, all that nonsense. Yeah. And, and propaganda. You should be your you should be in your husband's house. Well, how come you're talking about trees and yeah. what have you? And then yet you want to you want to lord over yeah. because now they see money in it potentially. You know, and they're taking it not from the position she would have taken. <laughs> now they're saying, oh, yeah, come, come, invest, invest, invest. Let's cut off indigenous trees, but invite you, as we discussed a few weeks ago on the other episode. You know, let's plant these new seeds that are, you know, less effective in capturing carbon anyway, you know, <laughs> because there's money in it. So, um, but uh, we, we, it would be it would be remiss of us if we do not say that uh, Sankara was not only uh, very vocal when it came to materials of environment and what have you on the issue of imperialism. As far as France is concerned, he was the most vociferous, shall we say, during that time in. And I draw uh, you guys' attention to his hosting of France President Francois Mitterrand in Ugadugu in 1986. Right. At a reception during that visit, Thomas Sankara put the French policy on Africa on full blast. In fact, I will take a quote from him. He says, we cannot understand why bandits like Jonas Savimbi Killers like Pieter Bota of Apartheid have been allowed or authorized to visit France. So beautiful and so decent, he was being sarcastic. They stain her with her hands and feet covered with blood. Those who allowed them to commit such actions will bear responsibility here and elsewhere in the world, now and forever. Yep. That's like an African curse, man. When an African puts it that way, he's saying it's going 
<laughs> with you <laughs> beyond this world. And Mithra did not like that. Exactly. Mm. So, how, how dare you black man speak to me who's superior right. to you in that way? Yeah, that was, uh, as we observed <laughs> when we were preparing for this uh, conversation, 100% mm -hmm. identical to what uh, Patrice Lumumba told King. Uh, uh, and I don't know how to say it in French. I think it's Baudouin. Baudouin. Yes, I think that's how you say it. Oh, Belgium. 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 Well, why are we worried about saying it right? But anyway, go on, brother. Okay. At the, <laughs> just butcher at the, it. At the independence. Uh, just the, what is the your name? Uh, uh, Nduku? Oh, come on. Go on. At the independence ceremony in 1960 in, uh, in uh, what is now Kinshasa at that time called Leopoldville. Uh, Patricia Momba spoke truth to power mm. when Boudoir dared to say that independence <laughs> was the culmination of King Leopold's brilliant <laughs> project. Yeah. Yes. King Leopold, the same King Leopold who exterminated 10 million Congolese, that. and Lumumba was supposed to sit there and pretend. They want us to that. No, I think at that point he said, you know what? Even if this is going to cost me my life. There comes Otherwise, a point. I'm as good as dead as there having comes a point you have in to say parliament that. and listen to this speech mm. and remain silent? No. So he confronted that speech. He said, no, 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 no. We cannot forget about the blood that has been spilled. We cannot forget being called boy mm -hmm. just because of the color of our skin. We cannot forget the blood spilled when we struggled for our liberation. And of course, that was his death sentence as far as the Belgians were concerned. And they literally and, tried to make him swallow the speech back. But absolutely. Cool, brother. And that mm -hmm. was a, a, a black soldier doing that at the behest of Belgium imperialism, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is very similar to Sankara standing while Mitterrand was sitting, mm. right, at that state dinner. And Sankara, speaking truth to power, said exactly what Adesoji just recounted right now. And that also is when they said, no, this African has got to do. As... Um... Bruno Jaffrey um, explained in his um, in his essay in uh, this book, by edited by Amber Murray, uh, a certain amount of madness. There he says, um, I'm trying to paraphrase now. That was when the Americans and the French decided this piano had to be tuned. Mm -hmm. Apparently, when you hear that phrase, it means that person had to be taken out. Mm -hmm. So it was that day. It was also funny that when you mentioned the treatment that uh, Lumumba got after his killing was the fact that on the morning of October 15, 1987, when Sankara came into his office, he had just finished jogging. So they weren't carrying any weapons. His bodyguards were unarmed. They were killed outside. He was inside talking. And then, where is he? Where is he? And, you know, with a sign of irritation, he goes outside. And they hose him down with an AK-47. But what was more <coughs> egregious was the fact that he wasn't given any decent burial for six days. In fact, his body was tossed into a public cemetery and it was the people that dug a grave for him and his bodyguards. So for six days. And then when Blaise Campari comes out to make a speech, I mean, you could, if you watch um, uh, that, uh, there's, a, there's a brilliant uh, documentary out there, The Upright Man. Mm -hmm. at the tail end of it you will see when the reporter asked him so what do you think he said well 
if he had not killed Sankara, Sankara would have killed him. Whereas all the reports that come out said that was not the first time, but the mm -hmm. fifth time they tried to kill Sankara. And every time they told him that this thing was against him, he told them there was no way Blaze can kill me. Because if Blaze kills me, he can, but I can't. I won't because, for right. one, he's his half brother. Like I said at the beginning of the show, he was adopted. Blaze Campari was adopted by Sankara's parents. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I asked my students, you know, after we watch this, we watch the documentary in all my classes every semester. Then I asked my students at the end when he was warned by his chief bodyguards to take action against Campari. Uh, you think he should have. And the majority, let's say in a class of 25, mm -hmm. about 20 or 22 would say, no, he should not have because he was on a different spiritual plane. And he had to be the person he was all the way. Because by arresting Campore and all his compatriots and maybe punishing them, that might have been the end of the revolution anyway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if it was just sacrificing one person himself with the possibility that the revolution might continue, maybe that's what that was uh, his thinking. Here's but my question. Three of my students would always say no. Yeah. He should have taken action because the revolution was much more important than his own life. Mm. So he couldn't evaluate it that way and say, oh, my life, he might take it. But you should have said, would the revolution continue exactly. without me? And since it's not yet been consolidated, I think it's worth sacrificing Blaise Campare. 100%. <laughs> In the interest of the revolution. So at least two or three students, every class take that position. I always wait. I show the end. documentary. We have all the discussions. And then I keep this as the last question in the class. Mm. And there's always at least a handful who say, yes, you should have taken care of Blaise Campore in yeah. the interest of the revolution. <laughs> and um, I mean, if you read all the books that have come out uh, um, subsequent, the reason he gave for not taking action is w the one you alluded to, is the fact that he's busy with the idea of people moving forward. Mm. But it's also funny that it is that spirit that God Blaise Campari removed. When the people decided you right. had to go, mm -hmm. regardless of how many killings in the streets, right. Right. they got him out. Right. Thanks for bringing that up. Absolutely. That was it. So it was and his that name. That's what gets me hopeful about yes. many African conditions and mm. many African countries. You know, we need to provide the spark mm. so that it, it does not take 27 years. True, true. Something like that to happen. But you're right, it didn't happen. Because he said, um, the subsequent uh, books that have been written said, you know, what was the spark for the revolution to remove uh, Blaise Campari? It was the fact that all of a sudden his speeches started, started being played mm. on public radio um public people speaking. are reminded of him you know you hear his voice it's like who is that speaking oh these were kids who were not born when right. he was in power they were they're not like, right because they're very young they're like no him oh where's his picture can we see his picture and then they see his picture you know they connect the fact that the voice with a face is like no this guy has to go and the fact that this guy was the one who took him out Ah, no, 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 he had to go. Right. And if you go watch all of those um, uprisings, as I would say, after, prior to him being deposed, you would see that the people were like, he had to go. Mm -hmm. he, there was, there is no amount of, you know, shooting in the streets and what have you. The people were just like, nah. Him? In place for him? Nah. You had to go. You, you had to go. So much so that, you know, uh, it was a crime for his posters to be on the wall. People actually mm. grabbed his picture on the side of their houses. Are you going to demolish my house? 
you know, and that was, you know, that was the beginning. So, um, it's interesting that we have revolutionaries like this in Africa, but instead we're asked to celebrate mediocres, right. you know, mm. the... Yeah. <laughs> with, with social media, we now have an opportunity to, mm. to educate more about um, Thomas Sankara. Mm -hmm. I like what a, um, a woman journalist, and I forget her name, said in another short documentary. A couple of things she said. Said uh, he showed us that the misery was avoidable. I love that. He filled the young people with hope. I love that. Mm -hmm. He brought us a moral dimension we lacked. I love that. And then this is the one I love the most. He showed us that a leader could be proud and dignified and serve his people. We never associated these qualities with African presidents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't beat this. This was so good when I heard her saying this. You know? And you could tell even the glee on her face mm. talking about this many years later you know mm, mm, mm. i mean i will enjoy people to read about thomas sankara we put a couple of resources in there um i will enjoy people to start with his words right you know sankara speaks mm -hmm. and then you can read about what people say about him um i would this uh a certain amount of madness is a collection of essays about journalists and people who met him, their takeaway from him, their thoughts on certain subject matters. It makes very interesting reading. This is a combination of all of those writings and his speeches as well. And then, um, what's his name? Vijay Prashad has gone into the archives, the CIA archives, so he is thrilled through and you will see very insightful take on what the Americans and the French thought of Sankara in here. And you posted um, that already? Yes, I posted that. And um, for entry point, if you just want a quick read, which is just about uh, 110 pages, you could read Ernest Hirsch, uh, right. Thomas, Thomas Sankara, Right, I have that too. Okay, so this nice is quick read. yeah, quick read. You know, quick read. You know, uh, you won't uh, you won't lose a train of thought. The others might be heavy lifting, but but I will enjoy you to get Sankara speaks. All his speeches, all his speeches are in there. I just wanted to point out the the achievements, right? That he made some of the achievements he made in Burkina Faso when he became president. And he was very organized and strategic. Um, they created a campaign to educate and train their children. They called it the Let's Teach Our Children campaign. They established committees to defend the revolution through which they established a vast house building program, 500 units of housing in three months. They built roads, they built small water collectors, and then they had an economic ambition to work to ensure the use of the mind and strength of each inhabitant of Burkina Faso will produce what is necessary to provide two meals a day and drinking water. And it's very simple. It's he, he starts with having a small plan that will inspire people and empower them to create even bigger plans. We as Africans in the solution that we look for must not um, gauge it based from a Western perspective, right? We have to gauge it based on, a, on an African perspective. What capabilities do we have now? Where do we have to go back to start where we are not dependent on them? And we must get comfortable with that, no matter how uncomfortable it is, so that we can eternally free ourselves from this dependency. But until then, we will forever be marginalized uh, and, and dependent on them, and they will forever control us. Yes, yes. Um, um, we are coming to the end of the show. Um, mm. uh, Brother Milton, do you have any final words? Aluta continua, may the spirit of Sankara uh, fill the youth of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, may they see the light. May they not tolerate 
any mediocre misrulers. Um, so I like some of the things I'm seeing in West Africa right now, supported by the young people, of course. I hope that their hopes are not betrayed and that imperialism does not disrupt the path that they seem to be trending toward right now mm -hmm. in the West African country. Because if it picks its melanchol, it will make it difficult for neo-colonial rulers in other African countries to stand in the way you know, of the people. So be very suspicious of the ones that are busy denouncing <laughs> the transformations ongoing in, in West Africa right now. Because of course their own position is very suspect. So that, uh, those are my closing words. Long live uh, the memory of Thomas Sankara and may he continue to rest in peace with the ancestors and may we continue to benefit from the knowledge he left mm. behind. Mm. Sister? I had to come back and unmute myself. For me, it's let's pay attention to what he's telling us, not just to learn what he's telling us, but for us to take action, right? Um, it is not enough that we read. It's very important, as Adesuji has made it clear several times, that we read. But once we read, once we get that information, it is also important for us to, to take action uh, uh, and make change. And the change is not going to come by us relying on these Westerners uh, the change is going to come by us taking action into our own hands and, and doing something about it. So let, let's do that. As uh, Rodney used to call that praxis, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Don't just uh, get the intellectual <laughs> knowledge, but take act on that. And he was one of the best examples of somebody mm -hmm. who practiced what he preached. I would... Um... I would like us to leave the show with his um, one of his final statements, <clears throat> which um, a question was posed to him by a journalist. It said, uh, the journalist said, um, what happened? He said, what happened with what? Um, how come this country has changed from what it used to be? It says, oh, you mean the fact that 70% of our food and our needs was provided by the um, UNICEF before me coming to power it says yes yes so what happened he said well you cannot make fundamental change without a certain amount of madness it took madness of yesterday for us to be able to act with extreme clarity today I want to be one of those mad men mm. we who to be mad means we have endured, we have dared to invent the future. And we are speaking to him now because he invented a new future at that time for Burkina Faso. So but Carmen, we can't leave it like that. <laughs> I also no, had no, something else to said, say though. But because I want what? people who are listening, who heard the words you just read, mm. think about it. 70% of your food was provided being provided as quote unquote aid. do you know what that does hmm. to a person's psyche mentality and psyche no wonder when he came and he reminded them that you can take agency over your own life no wonder they embraced him with so much they were love. ready they hmm. were ready because he opened their eyes and made people realize wait a minute why should I be that dependent mm -hmm. when I can produce my own food? So it become like an addictive drug, actually, that type of dependency. Mm. So as you're reading it, I was just, you know, analyzing it. And that's why I said, brother, please allow me to add a mm -hmm. few more sentences. But on, that, <laughs> and, but, but on that note, yes, may he continue to rest with the answers. Mm. Yes. And, 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 and as we continue the work uh, and not take away from that, last very important message. Just wanted to share with our community that myself and Ali Madi will be speaking at a different space at around 2 p.m. this afternoon. You can join us. I just put the link in the chat. Uh, let's be in every space uh, where we can speak from an African perspective uh, and change the false narrative that is uh, propagated against us. But again, 
peace to Baba Sankara. Thank you to him for all that he did to inspire us. And may we follow the messages that he has left for us and take action. Mm. Aluta, continue. Big draft seta. Asanteni. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm glad I was able to join you guys. <laughs> I, I borrowed my neighbor's computer, and this is the same computer I'll be using at 2 p.m. as well. Wait, wait a minute. The you so you're computer. in your you're in your house, but using a different computer. Exactly. I'm in my house using a different computer. So what happened? What happened they, to the They computer? probably sent me a bug or something in that. Yes, computer. it has been. Yes, that's yep. exactly what they've done to your computer. Yep. 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 Hey. Yeah, so you know, I may invest in another computer just for shows like this because it's important. Yeah, to, you know, not have it disrupted, and it always gets disrupted around the time you're about to have exactly. It. <laughs> you know, you hate to like start saying conspiracies and all but that, but you right? have to awaken to the, you know, the facts, smell of facts, the coffee, right? And smell know? the coffee, the consistency is just a bit too much, you know. So, I hope somehow they don't infect my neighbor's computer. <laughs> And you All know right, if so they I'm do, gonna, then you I'm, have I'm a gonna case. Get, I'm gonna get a quick bite, and I'll be ready at. Uh, if if you can two. if you can come in at quarter two, just so that they can brief you quickly, that would be All nice. Right. I'm gonna also so step away quickly, but they're sending send the, me the link. The same they're sending email, it right? to your email. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yep. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.